For the past decade, Oliver Twist has been my favourite book. As a result, it took me a while to warm to the Lionel Bart musical adaptation, or at least the 1968 film version that I've actually seen. I think it was primarily because it was what so many people thought of when they think of the story. In my teens, I actually attempted to write a page-by-page stage adaptation of Oliver Twist before stopping because that's just a really stupid idea. I didn't really understand the importance of changing the source material to fit the requirements of a different medium. Dickens wrote episodically, so unless you're adapting his work for an episodic format, you're going to have to seriously streamline his stories. So, once I understood that, I came to admire the performances and Bart's songs in this film. Whilst it isn't as dark as the book, especially with its portrayal of Fagin, it also isn't as saccharine as I expected, and retains a lot of what made the novel so great. I was also pleasantly surprised by Oliver and Company when I decided to watch it on Disney+. Whilst I can identify a few issues with it, it's a perfectly enjoyable middle-of-the-road Disney film, and I'm sure people nostalgic for the 80s will get even more out of it. As someone with a casual interest in Disney history, I was familiar with the film for several significant reasons, such as the involvement of Howard Ashman, the lyricist who is considered one of the most important people behind the Disney Renaissance. In fact, this is ironic, considering one of his most famous contributions to the formula is what Oliver and Company severely lacks. Not only does the titular protagonist not have an I want song, he doesn't sing once. Hello and welcome to Enchanted Essays, where I like to analyse films in the art of adaptation before screaming my findings into the digital void. I post new video essays and reviews every Friday, so feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. In this video, I will explain how and why Oliver and Company would have been improved if the protagonist sang, primarily by comparing it to Lionel Bart's Oliver and Mulan, as well as musical theatre tropes and conventions. Oliver and Company has five songs, all by different composers. Now, having different composers for every song can work if the different sounds are intentional. For example, it worked well to replicate the Dadaist style of Spongebob. However, this prevents Oliver and Company from having a distinct lyrical or musical style, the way something like The Lion King, My Fair Lady or Jesus Christ Superstar has. This also means that they probably weren't as involved with the development of the story. Maybe this was intended to show the variety of colourful characters or to reflect the diversity of the city itself, but I digress. The small number of songs is not necessarily a disadvantage either. Alice in Wonderland has the record for most songs at 15, but I think its songs are some of the least memorable in Disney's canon. Seriously, tell me how many songs you can remember in the comments. I've been watching Disney films with subtitles recently, and it's only then that I came to appreciate how efficiently they deliver exposition about the characters and settings. Most of the songs in Oliver and Company have a clear purpose in the story. Both Why Should I Worry and Perfect Isn't Easy are I Am songs, in which important side characters talk about who they are. Dodger sings about not having a care in the world. Why should I worry? Why should I care? Whilst Georgette sings about the fact she considers herself perfect. Of Gold is a song in which Rita teaches Oliver about the opportunities that their line of work can bring. If I could compare it to any of the songs in Lionel Bart's Oliver, it's a combination of Consider Yourself and You've Got to Pick a Pocket or Two. It both educates Oliver and welcomes him to the gang. Good Company is sung by Jenny, about how happy she is that she has found a friend in Oliver after she has taken him in. This is similar to Who Will Buy from Lionel Bart's musical adaptation, in which Oliver sings about how happy he is after being taken in by Mr Brownlow. Forever with me, we'll always be good 
The only one I can't quite figure out is a song co-written by Howard Ashman, Once Upon a Time in New York City. It is not sung by any of the characters, but by Huey Lewis of Huey Lewis in the News. It plays over the opening of the film, showing Oliver start in his litter of kittens before they are all taken and he is left alone in the rain. The lyrics are a nice setup of New York, but it doesn't feel like they fit the story that well. They're about the fact that, despite it being a big old, bad old, tough old town, it's where dreamers make their start. Whilst I think that Ashman's lyrics are beautiful, they are too vague. Whilst there are plenty of great emotional Disney songs with relatively vague lyrics, these feel better suited to a film about someone moving to New York to further their career than a child trying to find a family. It's comparable to Disney's Tarzan, which tried to replace the songs of the Disney Renaissance structure with a Phil Collins soundtrack which, whilst beloved on its own, failed to let viewers connect with the characters in the same way their musical films did. In fairness, Tarzan was attempting to avoid being a musical. Oliver and Company is a musical. The protagonists' feelings and motivations shouldn't be narrated to the audience. We need to see them sing it in a musical. Now, Oliver Twist is known for having side characters that are far more interesting than the protagonist. And that's okay. Dickens himself performed extracts without Oliver in them at all, such as Nancy's murder. However, there's a difference between letting the side characters shine and neglecting the protagonist completely. I'm not saying it needs 16 songs like Oliver or 13 songs like the film adaptation, but it should at least give the opportunity for the protagonist to sing. Most of the songs in Oliver are sung by side characters. Mr. Bumble, Fagin, The Artful Dodger, Nancy, etc. However, Oliver himself does get the opportunity to sing, and one of them is part of that all-important musical formula that Howard Ashman introduced to Disney, the I Want song. This kind of song exists in the Broadway musical from Wouldn't It Be Loverly, Eliza Doolittle, and My Fair Lady, tells us what she wants, Rogers and Hammerstein, every show. The leading lady has a chance to plunk herself down on a tree trunk somewhere <laughs> and to sing about what she dreams about. Um, and she sings, this is what I want in life. It's called the Girls I Want Song. Disney version of saying the beginning of every film of, of, of the classic fairy tales. There's a version of this song. It's fascinating. It's, we, we screened Cinderella about a month ago. And the Dream is a Wish is one. Snow White, somehow they got away with two, but I, I'm wishing and someday my prince are exactly the same song. Whilst there were already plenty of Disney films with I Want songs, it wasn't until later that the formula was identified and regularly implemented when Ashman started work on The Little Mermaid. By then, Broadway and West End had already established this more substantial formula after decades of trial and error, a formula Disney has replicated in all of its musicals since. So, in The Little Mermaid, Ariel wants to be where the people are, and she sings it to us. In Beauty and the Beast, Belle wants something more than this provincial life, and she sings it to us. In Aladdin, Aladdin wants people to look closer and find out that there's so much more to him, and he sings it to us. In The Lion King, Simba wants to be the main event, like no king was before, and he sings it to us. In Pocahontas, she wants to be free to explore once more just around the riverbend, and she sings it to us. In The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Quasimodo wants to spend a single day out there, and he sings it to us. In Hercules, Hercules wants to find where he belongs, and he sings it to us. In Mulan, she wants to have her outward appearance be a reflection of who she feels she is inside, and she sings it to us. If you want to find out more about I Want Songs, I'll link a few videos about it down below. In Oliver, the title character's I Want Song is Where Is Love, in which he sings of wanting to find the love of a family he has never had. This affects his relationships with the other characters throughout the musical. It's why he is taken in by the artful Dodger and Fagin's description of camaraderie in songs like Consider Yourself and Be Back Soon. It's why he becomes close to Nancy in I Do Anything. Not only does his I Want song inform us of what he wants, but it establishes why he has these emotional connections with those around him for the rest of the movie. The opening scene that Once Upon a Time in New York City plays over does show all of the other kittens being picked up by families except Oliver, despite him similarly vying for their attention. Therefore, you could agree that this is established in the film, just not through the medium of song. 
Oliver's other main song in the Bart musical is Who Will Buy, a song in which Oliver sings about how happy he is after being taken in by Mr Brownlow. This establishes how he feels after he has what he wants. This morning is not perfect for him because of the beautiful home he is in or the beautiful morning itself. It's a beautiful morning that he wants the opportunity to treasure forever because he has finally received the love that he wanted. Disney's Oliver could have had a similar opportunity to sing his feelings to the audience in the song Good Company. As I said before, it is sung by Jenny, the lonely little girl who takes in Oliver. She's raised by her butler and her parents can't even come home for her birthday, so it's very clear what she wants and why Oliver's company is a relief for Jenny. Considering the song is very short and most of it is a big musical interlude in the middle, I think it would have worked better if Oliver had a verse in the song to show that he mirrors Jenny's sentiment. This would essentially be his who will buy moment, in which he rejoices at the love he has finally found before it is taken away from him again. Of course, you could argue that Disney films typically have fewer songs than the average stage musical, so they don't have time for that. Whilst musicals express all of their most emotional moments through song and dance, Disney films are often without songs in their climax, in which they mostly focus on action for a reprise playing over the final shot of the film. However, I think a better example of how to use a few songs efficiently in a Disney film is Mulan. Mulan only has four songs, but they were efficient. I think that, if we had more songs, it would take away from the action and, and the emotional brevity the film has. Whilst there are dark, dramatic musicals that are about war, such as Les Mis and Miss Saigon, Disney films can choose to rely on the strength of their visuals instead. All of the songs in Mulan serve a specific function. Both Bring Honour to Us All and A Girl Worth Fighting For establish the different standards for men and women that Mulan is rebelling against from both a female and a male perspective. For multiple supporting characters, they are chorus members showing that this reflects the broader public opinion of that population. This exposition is a far more amusing and efficient way than just explaining what the characters already know, especially with the former song. Make a Man Out of You shows how Mulan becomes a soldier and becomes friends with her peers. However, arguably the most important song in the film is Reflection, an I Want song in which Mulan explains what she wants to be able to express who she truly is without being a disappointment to her parents of Mulan that makes the finale so emotional. While stumbling upon the massacre at the end of A Girl Worth Fighting For is brutal with its stark juxtaposition of tone, the most emotional moments of Mulan are the ones in which she gets what she wanted. Not only does society laud her as a hero for disobeying every rule of her gender to save China, but her father no longer cares about their family honour. Whilst he always appreciated who she was, he doesn't care about their honour anymore, not because of what she has done, but because the fear of losing her has made societal shame no longer seem important. If you... I know my place. It is time you learned yours. Their gifts to honour the Fa family. The greatest gift in honour is having you for a daughter. I'm not saying Oliver and Company ever had the chance of being on par with Mulan or Oliver by adding a single song. The film has many other issues with script and characters. What I am saying is that it would have allowed audiences to connect to its protagonist and understand how the other characters affect his goal. Despite other characters taking up the spotlight in the finale, we would be more interested in getting Jenny back because of what she means to Oliver. It would keep the audience focused and emotionally engaged throughout, regardless of how complicated the actual plot may be. And yes, it's still a lot of fun and I definitely recommend checking it out. It's certainly flawed, but I think it's a shame that so few people realise how important it was in animation history. Even The Black Cauldron now has more representation in merchandise than Oliver and Company, a film that Disney has seemingly tried to make audiences forget for decades. 
Why Should I Worry is definitely one of the most underrated Disney songs in my opinion. Did you grow up with this film or discover it as an adult? Which song is your favourite? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. Whilst there isn't much information about the creation of Oliver and Company, aside from a six minute featurette, some of it is covered in Waking Sleeping Beauty, the documentary covering the history of the studio from the mid 80s to the middle of the Disney Renaissance, primarily focusing on, on how the change in leadership changed the company and how those same conflicting egos led to the studio's downfall. It's surprisingly honest from a Disney documentary. I also recommend the Glad in Gladiators video about Oliver and Company, as well as Sarah Sterling's video from her Down to Disney series about Disney history. If you want to watch any of the videos I've referenced in this essay, all of the links are in the description. If you want me to make more content like this, you can let me know by liking the video. If you want to be the first to find out the topic of my next video, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Enchanted Essays. Anyway, I need to go. I've got a cab to catch. See you soon! Aunt Rue is a witch! I don't care!